want to start by thanking all the folks who organized the conj um, for stewarding closure, the language, closure of the community, giving me a job that uh, I enjoy doing on top of the other people that I'm going to thank now, which is I want to thank my family and my parish family for understanding that to provide for them materially, I need to uh, work. And I'm just very grateful to have work that's also, for me, intriguing and interesting. Um, and finally, I want to thank my current employer, which is Reify Health. Uh, we do awesome work for um, clinical trial research and bringing life-saving therapies and medications to market faster. So, and we're hiring. So if you're interested, see one of the guys from Reify Health. All right. So I really appreciate the opportunity to talk because for the last two years, I have been mulling over all these different ideas that finally kind of condensed into identifying tables as something central to the way that I think and as something fundamental. And really, the, the, the title of this talk should be Tools of Thought. And this is stealing Dr. Kenneth Iverson's uh, Turing Award paper, uh, Notation as a Tool of Thought. Um, and the longer I spend at the computer, I realize that all my efforts to optimize this hard machine are thwarted by my lack of efforts to optimize the soft machine, or as my uh, coworker Alex Reddington put, the meat computer. Um, we spend a lot of time optimizing the hard ones and not nearly as much optimizing our workflows for human cognition. And so tables in that regard represent a fundamental tool for representing data, for thinking through data, for forcing us as human beings to uh, think critically about intersections of data and its attributes, and furthermore, provide an actual visual notation that has immediate impact on human beings. We're hardwired uh, for visual stimulus. Natural language, as we all know, is not exactly designed for conveying information. More often than not, natural human language is in fact designed to allow us to deceive one another. Right? We spend a lot of time speaking around topics. And so for computer science and for our programming lives and for thinking through data, we need a language that is a little bit more unambiguous, not totally unambiguous, even though this is beautiful, right? E. e. Cummings wrote this poem. And it happens to leverage both the visual impact of having letters cascade down like a falling leaf and also leaving you a bit lonely feeling by the end of it. If we're going to use visual notations, if we're going to be visualizing data, we need to do it in a rigorous fashion. And there are a number of people in this field, and I'm going to highlight a couple of names and a couple of works that I've spent time reading through and have really enjoyed. Um, Edward Tufte is a mainstay. Uh, he wrote, his, he has four books that intertwine these ideas of honest, um, deliberate, and uh, thought through visualization of quantitative data, quantitative information. And uh, it's no small feat. It's full of nuance. Um, and they're worth uh, slow study. So we're not going to go through them uh, quickly here. I suggest you read them. Anybody ever drawn boxes on a whiteboard with arrows to describe a software design? OK, everybody, right? If you have done even as much as that, I highly recommend reading this paper by Daniel Moody. This is a paper that synthesizes a number of findings in cognitive research and also provides a rigorous approach to, um, a rigorous approach to evaluating visual notations. So in this work, he goes through not only the uh, variables, the vocabulary we have available to ourselves visually, that human beings are, are able to differentiate, for example, these kinds of visual variables at these scales, right? Um, map makers have known this for a long time. Software engineers who write diagrams often don't take advantage of the breadth of human capacity to interpret visual input. So in this paper, there are some nice little gems that show the various tools we have access to. They also show that it's good to have reinforcing visual variables because there's no color in this slide. The paper was published in black and white. I don't want to take credit for the idea here, so I just dropped this part of the paper in. In language processing, um, there are two parts of the brain that are involved in speech production and comprehension. Um, there are more than that, but there are two main ones. One is the Broca area, and one is the Wernicke area. And um, due, unfortunately, to brain trauma incidents, where uh, scientists are able to study the impact of damage to one or more parts of the brain, 
they've determined that the Broca area is primarily focused on the physical execution of speech, that it is you know, how we actually move our lips and our tongue and our throat to produce sounds, and that the Wernicke area is more of the semantic region, that it's a dictionary that has all the meanings that we know about for our, for our native language. And when there is trauma to only that semantic area, the Wernicke area, and not to the Broca area, you find people with a kind of aphasia where they can actually speak fluidly but nonsensically. And the opposite is true, that if there's damage to the Broca area, they may maintain all their knowledge of their native language and what words mean, but they're no longer able to produce speech. A similar divide exists in lots of human cognition and visual, and visual processing is, not, is one of them, is not uh, uh, alien to this. We process visual stimulus very quickly. We see patterns, we see shapes, we see colors, all those visual variables that I put on the slide previous. We process them almost effortlessly. And the argument in the paper, and it holds for all kind of visual, visualization of data, the more information we can embed and shove into purely visual stimulus, the more we are optimizing the meat computer, the more we are optimizing this soft computer and allowing, our, and allowing space for the harder semantic processing that we get into, we have to think through an actual problem, an unknown space. So the idea here is that tables form an absolutely fundamental component of any visualization period in flatland, as Tufti would put it. In two-dimensional space, a table, we're going to take the opposite approach for closure talks today. We are not going to Get a, get, take table and get our dictionary of choice off the shelf and find the definition and the etymology and then hone in on it. I'm going to take the opposite approach. I want to just ever so slightly expand the scope of table. A table for this talk is any representation of data in which that data is aligned by at least two dimensions. That's it. We have to be careful with all these visual variables because sometimes one plus one does not equal two. Sometimes one plus one equals three or more. And the visual impact of carelessly throwing ink on the page can result in things like this, where we see not just black stripes, but in fact white stripes as well. All right, we're going to just relax ourselves a little bit, sit back, pretty pictures coming, and then code, right? Tables first. That's not a table, is it? Two-dimensional space, data is aligned. These are divisions in World War I stationed in France. The division numbers are the actual visual blocks of this, of this graph, of this table. And it shows immediately their duration in France and how many divisions were there by October of 1918. Similarly, stem and leaf plots, not as popular anymore, but a very, very useful tool for showing a distribution. This is 218 volcanoes and their heights graphed using their actual heights. Some tables need a little help. This is a Washington, D.C. Uh, bus route that I dealt with in college. There are more contextually appropriate ways to represent similar data. So if, I'm, if I live near one station, I'm less concerned about every stop time for every other station, but relative to where I'm going to be, I want to know what times of day I have stops and the frequency of those stops. So here's an example of a stem and leaf plot used for, uh, bus, for train uh, departure times. Time is not remote from tables. Here we have kind of a, a, a very honest representation of how art does not simply stop at some year, right, but the influence of different, here in this case, letter forms. This is a table of contents for a book that can be read sequentially by columns, so it's a columnar representation, really, of the, of the sequence of the book, but it's in a tabular, tabular format because it represents musical modes that are rotated through weekly in a liturgical service, and so the person can find the mode and the service they're in if they need to find for what they're doing today. Tables do have all kinds of hierarchical data in them in practice. If we're in Excel, we might struggle with uh, shoving that graph data, that heterogeneous data into a table, but they're everywhere. And there are 21 pages in the Chicago Manual of Style dedicated to how to handle tables correctly. And the rule of thumb, just like with any visualization, is less is more. Every line or rule you add to a table needs to have a purpose. Not all tables are read from left to right. Some tables take advantage of the left to rightness more than others. You're just getting all my nerd stuff now. I wanted to get Old English into the talk. Language textbooks like to deceive, tricking you into thinking there's uniformity in the language by using tables, but there's not. 
it's full of exceptions. And that's the beauty of it. This is an awesome visualization stolen from one of Tufti's books. Music, of course, is tabular by default, right? Staves and harmonies and all kinds of instruments and, and symphonic scores are, are tabular. But here is dance forms aligned to the music and uh, succinctly showing all of the movements of the body and, and relative to time. More nerdery typography, spacing. Right? This is a table too, right? We don't often see them, but any kind of juxtaposition in two-dimensional space of relevant forms draws the eye to compare them. Not all tables have to be filled with data that is represented as data. Sometimes it's effective to put many visualizations into the table itself. This is five years of weather data shoved into one small table. And this brings up a good point that Tufty also emphasizes, that we should respect our viewers and our readers that they're smart enough to navigate a table like this, not just to give them today's current weather and the wind direction maybe, but this is five years of, of data for February, that's what the two represents, and then aggregate information at the bottom. This is a fairly sad table. It's a table of causes of death. And by itself does not give us that impact that visualizations often do, that is that a table can show us both a larger pattern and is excellent for small comparisons between individual points. But this is an example of fitting a ton of information on one page, not just data, but information. In this table, there are over 1.7 million possible pairwise comparisons in this table on one book page. And Tufty re remarks that this is a formula we can lean on, that if n is the number of cells on a table, these are the number of pairwise comparisons that we can, we can make with that table in both ambiguous and unambiguous forms. <laughs> Finally, things that we don't think about as being tabular are often naturally, we, we naturally impose a tabular uh, overlay on them. And this is, you probably can't see in the back, but there's a very faint grid line applied to this, uh, applied to this plot. And uh, when seeing the overall pattern, again, we're not looking for rigid uh, adherence to a table, but when comparing points, we are. All right, we gotta speed through this and take it too long on this part. Uh, integrating visualization with text and numbers. It doesn't have to just be either. It should be what's appropriate to the data. There are 65 months worth of data crammed into that little spark line in between these points in a table. It's highly effective use of space. Same thing here, aligned in a table, allowing for immediate visual comparison and movements of the data across these different fields. All right, so enough about general visualization. Let's start narrowing the scope down into possible programming topics, right? This is a classic truth table pulled from a logic textbook. We're gonna find a representation that might be a little more effective for our use cases. This is Yang from Wikipedia. Tables are not just representations of, we'll steal some more linguistic terms, intransitive data, that is data that we recognize as stationary data that we can uh, view, but also transitive data, that is code as data as code. This, this is a encoding of, a sta of state transitions uh, in a table, where if I'm in one of the states in the first column and I get inputs from anything in the rows, that I enter the new state specified in the target cell. Which brings us to this. When you're specifying a system, even one that's not particularly complex, how often do you miss an edge case? No edge case misses. I, I knew it was just me. All right. Um, in this table, the most interesting part of this table is the part that's missing. This is from the Chicago Manual of Style. Why is there no or? because May is already as short as it's going to be, right? But that absence is immediately perceived visually. Um, we shouldn't forego actual programmatic checks of exhaustiveness, but presenting ourselves with visualizations that target our ability to see patterns instantaneously are helpful. And we saw yesterday in the Rebel talk how compelling it can be uh, when we present ourselves with uniform representations of data as the human, right? It is appropriate that at the REPL print, print a form that can be read back in. But for actual human work at the, at the computer, we should also provide ourselves one of those three monitors we probably, most of us have, something more visual. And almost every default visualization in REPL that Stu showed yesterday was a table, not the only one. And we should definitely look at some prior art. We shouldn't bypass prior art. I'm not gonna suggest we go into the walled garden of object-oriented programming with uncontrolled state mutation. 
But there are some tools that the small talk folks and the Faro small talk folks in particular have built that are compelling in the same space. This is me shipping some closure to a server REPL and getting some things back and using the small talk version of REBEL, the built-in universal browser, to traverse this data. This is a set of closure maps of dictionaries, English words, how many vowels they have, and I can do, I can click into these guys, into the same kind of left to right shift that, that Stu was showing yesterday, and keep going and going, and have immediate, have not only one visualization, but multiple visualizations, and also the ability to evaluate in the context that I'm in. Right? Having the tool be actually six inches away is really important. Um, sometimes we, you know, we build those little tools in Clojure. We don't always do it, but if it's right there, we will use it. Likewise, for file systems, this is Clojure's code base as a file system tree, but it also has multiple other representations built in to this distro of Smalltalk. This is just one of the things they've, they've been working on. And so here are file sizes. Here's nesting and complexity. Um, all these parts are, are parts of Clojure. This is the Git index. And so anyway, um, I wanted to add this in since I saw all the wonderful work that Stu and team have put into Rebel. There are some, other, there, there are some existing tools out there that might, might inform a little bit the kind of visualizations that could be, could be default. All right. If anyone had shown this to me when I was in school, I would have thought about mathematics very differently. If they had then shown me things like this, and then show me that I can think about the relationship of numbers like this. I feel like my education would have been totally different. That I would have immediately understood that mathematics is not about arbitrary numbers, but about relationships. And um, Dr. Kenneth Iverson, whose paper title I stole at the beginning, has a tools of thought. He used tables like these in a textbook that he wrote for teaching algebra to, to, to students. And when we look at these, right, all of a sudden, we're seeing patterns. Yes, we can look at the individual numbers. We can see small micro comparisons, but it also reveals a pattern. This doesn't always work for data in the large, for real data. We, we do need data, data visualization. But there are many scopes of our work that are small enough and functions that we write that are limited enough that we should take the time to think about how could I represent this function, its behavior, across a, uh, an appropriate size domain in a table. All right, quiz time. What table is this? All right, it's not a table, right? I said two dimensions, right? Okay, I lied. What table is this? Yes. All right. This is a useful representation of and. We could use true false. We saw true false in the truth table before. All right. Those who answer, don't answer now. For those who didn't answer the first time, which one is this? All right, very good. I gotta put the pressure on you guys too. He uses this kind of work throughout this textbook and it entered into the APL language, it entered into the J language, it entered into array programming in general. And so we're gonna, it's a, it's a teaser for what's coming later. To read them, for those who still don't understand what we were looking at, this is how to read those function tables. That a function can be specified top left, and its left domain and its right domain are along the column and the header row, and then the range, that is the, the actual behavior of the function, its return value, populates the body of the table. In this case, we have multiplication. All right. Closure code time. All right. All right, for those who are new to Clojure, I apologize that during parts of this, you're gonna find me misusing these forms. And I encourage you not to panic and do not try to do everything at the REPL as you see, but we'll get to those in a little bit. There are tables hiding in our Clojure code and it would behoove us to recognize when we see them. The simplest one that we write every single day is a let binding. A let binding is actually a table, right? The first column, are the binding forms, the right, uh, the right are the values that are being, uh, being bound to. So as I'm coding these days with my uh, excellent CIDR and, whoever, and what all, all the tools that we use are, are, are really coming along, I wanna thank uh, the maintainers of those. Um, oftentimes I'll go through a code base and start hitting 
that key combo to, to get those columns lined up, right? And that's satisfying. And here, unsurprisingly, things line up and things, things work. Oftentimes, I'll be in a real code base, one that I've written, and I'll do that in a let binding like this. And all of a sudden, my, half my bindings go off the screen. I can't see anything. And this just seems like a nuisance, right? I just do undo and I keep going. I shouldn't do that, right? This is a table. And it can uh, indicate a situation where I'm doing more than one salient thing in a let binding. And I don't have to make every single let binding be a small, homogeneous view on my program's problem, but it can indicate that perhaps I do need to do a little refactoring or I have uh, some, some abstraction scope creep where I'm sitting. So at least have it be uh, a moment where we pause and think, maybe I shouldn't, you know, maybe this isn't a place to be bamboozled here. I'll get bamboozled later or in another function. It all still works. But. All right. So, how many of you guys have ever written more than one conditional statement in a single function? More than one if or cond or, I mean, I know I have. Man, everybody waited. Okay. Uh, every single code base I've ever worked in has at least one file with at least one function that is at least 60 lines long, which is fine, and has one of those, one of those uh, storytelling versions of an algorithm that uses if and cond and case, which are, which are all fine. Um, and it's natural for us, and some algorithms do naturally express themselves in that kind of storytelling, functional yet imperative code, code shape. But there are many cases, there are many cases where if we thought about it for a little bit and considered the intersection of, of the possible conditions that are being tested and worked through in that nested, nested conditional, that we could actually represent it as a table. And so one small tool that I use uh, is called Contable. All right. First take out. And it looks like this. So Cond is very useful. And this is a version of Cond that forces you to align conditions in a tabular format. So you have, uh, you have a header row and you have a first column. And by default, by default the, the, the operation here is to consider all of this. Better widen it. Uh-oh. Doomed. There we go. So this is the expansion of that macro. It's a simple con statement. It just ands those conditions together, but it forces you visually and the macro programmatically checks that you've actually provided some kind of path past this, right? And not every path will have a meaningful result, but it's like using if enclosure with only a then branch. As a reviewer of code, I see that. I think to myself, did you just forget to write the else branch? If you meant to use a single then branch, just use when. Right? So in this case, you can make these no-ops, but oftentimes in a real system, a no-op means log it or send it to a metrics, uh, metrics aggregator. It means something more than just ignore it. And when you've given yourself a slot you have to fill, it's satisfying, number one. We don't like blanks and tables. Number two, you're going to do something useful there. So this is a very simple one. It's like a slice of a state machine. It's a slice of, a view, a slice of a, a one state in a history of states. Um, and so it's useful for small, small scope things. If you want to go farther, multi-methods provide a natural environment for expressing things in a, in a table format and using Clojure's existing tools to implement that table as a specification of a system. So here, I am setting up a very simple world where I have some entity outside of my domain and some entity local to my domain, and I have to create some external entity, whether it's a user or something else I have to create, and I have a local identity for that thing as well, and I'm going to coordinate these a little bit. And I have all these different cases that I want to handle. And I know that I need to handle if it's already out there or if it's not out there or if it's here and it's not here, do they match? All these different cases. And I would naturally incline to use a multi-method anyway for this. Right? It's, an, it's a natural place for me to express in various parts of my code, okay, I now know I'm in the state of the external thing exists, the local thing doesn't, proceed multi-method, dispatch for me. But we're going to take multi-method and, ex and, and, and uh, increase its power by representing in a, in a purely data fashion here a table of possible eventualities that uh, when we look at it just ends up being a map of again think about like a function table left domain right domain and, and the intersection of those 
and that's what is used as the dispatch function for the multi-method above. So this is a, this is a completely data-driven, almost no library code involved, just multi-methods used in a way that allows you to be exhaustive in a particular scope of your work and check programmatically. Not only that you've, that you've specified all of them, but furthermore, Clojure gives you introspection into multi-methods. You can ask for all of the methods in a multi-method. So here, I didn't ask about font sizes. Are we good on font sizes? Awesome. I can check what's not done, right? I only did one here. I only, only uh, defined the error entity mismatch eventuality. And here, I can say I have three more to do. And this can exist in my test suite. There's no reason it can't be there. Run the tests. Multi-methods often, and by design, span multiple namespaces. And no one namespace may own all of the implementations of the multi-method. But you, as maintainer of a whole system, do know at what point in the system's boot all of them should be defined. And if you just forgot one, or you forgot to add a require statement someplace to pull its implementation in, having this in your, in your test suite gives you that peace of mind, right? You don't find it at runtime that there's no dispatch for uh, a value. All right. Sometimes the tables get unwieldy, and it's, it's helpful to have a visual tool. We don't have anything like that built in to any environment that I'm aware of outside of spreadsheets themselves being all one big table. Um, but we can certainly use any format that we want to, and I have an example here of using uh, org mode. Pretty powerful table environment, tabbing, you can run code in here. This is, uh, this is a meta-analysis of my process for composing talks. There's a lot of checking Twitter. And there's no reason why I can't take that representation and display it in an actual table using whatever tools I want, JavaFX like Rebel did. In this case, I used HTML because it's most at hand for me, a local file. And if, I'm, if I want to make sure this stays updated, do I have to pull down like JavaScript frameworks and get my whole build in place and have WebSockets going? Um, no, I really don't. I just have to do this, add it to the top. It'll refresh the page while you're working. Simple tool. Um, but anyway, having this in place and being able to edit it would be, would be wonderful. And there are environments that allow us to do that, but they're not textual. And I'll briefly give some uh, kudos to the JetBrains folks who develop MPS, which is a uh, projectional editing environment. I'm not going to go into it. It's another talk. But it provides uh, a way to believe you're interacting with text, but you're actually building out the AST of a program. And, uh, it, and there's a C implementation using MPS that is completely textual, except for interesting things like specifying state machines in your C code using a table. The default syntax is more object looking with curly braces. And then there's a, a, uh, an in editor tool to switch to this kind of view. And it's editable itself. And things like this procrastinate and how much free time I had or didn't have. Um, are scoped to the column, right? So it's a complete executable table embedded, in that case, in the actual editor that you're, you normally use. Here is just a visual representation, still very useful. I should still put this in front of myself all the time as I'm working. And here, again, I can definitely see the parts that I didn't fill out and the parts that I'm probably being dishonest about. All right, we're doing good on time. All right, this is where we kind of start to slowly drift farther away from what is available to us in Clojure by default and to look a little bit beyond um, Lisp and to take some cues from the array programming community. Um, I know for myself, I thought for a long time, that's all stuff for data analysts and it's all number crunching. It's got nothing to do with what I do on a daily basis. My world is heterogeneous. Um, but most of my job is actually creating homogeneous views on a heterogeneous universe. Right? And tables, and in the same kind of tables as an upper category, uh, array-based uh, multidimensional data that is itself not heterogeneous uh, is a useful distillation of heterogeneous data. And we spend a lot of time building those things, and I think it'd be really awesome if we took time as a community to build out some closure libraries that allow us to take advantage of some of the really interesting algorithms that exist when we take the interesting heterogeneous data that we work in and get it down into a, a matrix, for example. So they, some of these examples come from Q, uh, which is a, a descendant of APL and has a built-in uh, database engine called KDB+. It's not free, it's not open, but you can pull down a free version to try out the things. So some of the, some of the code here is, is uh, inspired by, um, by that language and that tool. All right, when you come to Clojure the first time as a Clojure developer, first time seeing a list, it can be pretty scary. 
I don't know what all the parentheses do. I don't know what the forms do. I don't know, like, does that tick mean quote or is that tick part of the reader literal for var or who knows, right? So as a, as a new user, it's helpful to read through things. And I could just more pretty print a closure form, but it might be useful to think, okay, I have data in front of me. I have this tree. Oopsies. I have this tree in front of me. What can I do to create information out of this data? What can I add to these raw forms? So I could just like, identify the type of each thing. And so this is a, a little snippet of code that, I'm gonna make this smaller, that walks through, I'm sorry if you can't read it, but it walks through each form using pre-walk and just has the type as part of the header. So persistent list, persistent list fun, et cetera, et cetera. And if you need, that's, that's going top down and we can go the other way and go bottom up. All right, a lot of the array programming languages and Q in particular has tables as a built-in data structure as a first class concept. And you can take any kind of heterogeneous data, you can take kind of mapped data and whip it into a table. And at that point, there are features of that platform that are specific, that are built out for it. Um, but it's a columnar representation. And so here are some tools that allow us to look at data that we'd normally look at like this. It's just a sequence of maps with different values. And if I were to um, think about those less as just different maps, which are open, and they are and they should be, and that should not change, but for a particular problem that I'm in right now, a subset of my data needs a, a homogeneous view, I can take that and I can get my parentheses correct and flip it. And now I have a mapping of each of the unique keys that I care about and the, co the column values for them. And I can take that representation and I can flip it and get myself an actual table. Right, this is just closures, uh, closure pretty print print table with a little bit less visual noise in the, in the representation. I can always get back. and get the same representation, right? But it's a different way of thinking about things. And if I have a table at hand, I sort of think about what do I do with tables? I query tables. I treat tables as groups of relations. Here's another pretend universe. Data about people and their operating systems. But I'm struggling here because all of a sudden I've got data that I don't want to have to make everything totally uniform. Right? I want to be able to have messy maps in the middle of my otherwise clean and homogeneous data structures that are multidimensional. Thankfully, we're working in closure. We don't have to adhere to some notion that every single possible multidimensional structure has to be totally even and non-ragged. I can have ragged maps inside here, and then I can present them to myself with visual tools when appropriate. I don't care about all the details of the OS, but I have the icons there. And these are just examples of how I could query a structure like that based on uh, Q's own query language. And I think this is already rendered for my final thing there. So anyway, uh, having it in a table format automatically, automatically inspires me to think about querying it in a structured fashion. It needn't be this particular dialect that I cooked up. It could be anything. Pure closure functions would be fine too, obviously. There we go. All right. Closures namespaces. Right? A namespace can be thought of as a table that has lots of rows, all the var bindings, and their metadata could be the columns. Right? That's one possible way of thinking about a namespace. And if I were to look at all the names, all of the rows in a table, say for uh, closure core, there's a lot going on in there. I'm going to have to kind of hone down a little bit. Same concept. Here is an example of giving myself a table and when it's there, I start thinking about what could, I, what could I do? How could I introspect on this data? And if this were actually provided to me by default, right? if I were, say, doing NS publics, which I do often in a new namespace, if I had a rebel open that was passively showing me like a table of all the bindings that came back as a table, I might stop typing and I might go click a little bit. I might stay right there and start writing more closure code to navigate that space, but now it's structured. Now it's in a, in a format that I can understand. All right. That. We saw earlier function tables and how useful they can be. They needn't be limited only to mathematical functions. If I had substring slightly redefined to allow it to have just two arguments, the string I'm substringing 
and the indices I care about, then I could have a function table like this. So we see the function tables are, again, two-dimensional space. We have to find a way to kind of cram a function we care about into a two-arity function. But when we've done that, we have one table representation, not particularly useful because one of my parts of my domain is static, right? This becomes most, most interesting when I make the domain realistic, right? There's no reason why for most of the functions that we write, the, the small ones, the pure ones, the, the scoped ones, that we shouldn't provide ourselves meaningful representations that traverse the entire scope of at least part of the domain, right? We still have generative testing and all those tools available to us to really exercise a much larger swath of the domain. But oftentimes it's in those first few uh, concentric circles of the domain of our functions we find something we didn't expect. And having it visually in front of us is, super, is very helpful. All right. With this representation, no reason we can't also memoize and save this processing. Right? This is a visual tool to me, but I might also say to myself, I know that for a given function, let's say I'm doing temperature uh, conversions, I know I'm only dealing with a certain temperature range. I might as well pre-calculate all of those. I might have it as a, as a function, that's fine. But I could also just create, use memo and use the, in this case it uses core cached and, and core memo to do um, the caching. But I can table that and, big caution, if you do this, make sure that you, know, you think about what you're, what you're pre-processing, because if you thought your app was slow before, for the talk, I try to throw a thread sleep in there to demonstrate you know, 500, 500 you know, arguments, each sleeping for two seconds. It's a long time to wait. All right, we see these representations, again, of the core mathematical functions. Easy to do, not always easy to do consistently. Right? So we have division by zero as, as on the JVM, an exceptional case. In some platforms it's not. On, in J, for example, it's treated differently. And in here, I mimic what J does by allowing division by zero to, be, to be come back as, as infinities. So a little bit of care is, is, is required. But these functions that I present here, and I'm going re to release the code after the talk so that you can look at it, uh, it's, it's, not, it's not rocket science. Most of it is, is, is very straightforward adaptations of existing print functionality. All right, here we go. Array programming. This is the part that if you're new to Clojure, just please don't, don't be deceived by what, what plus and other functions do. So we're used to collections like that. Um, we're not, we have collections like these two all the time. Right? We find ourselves mapping and mapping over various layers of our, of our code. Number one, just providing ourselves an aligned version of that can oftentimes give us immediate visual cues as to patterns in the data. It's not, it shouldn't be the default representation. Where are all the, where are all the brackets? It's nested collections, but it's, it's visually helpful. It's so helpful in array programming languages that there is a way to reshape arbitrary flat collections in a shape, in a multidimensional shape. So this reshape does that and provides shapes like this that if I were then to, pr to print out would look like this. So this is four rows, this is three rows, four columns. So it's a three by four table of values. Now here's where for me the big cell of array programming comes in. I'm getting close to time, so I'm going to move quickly. I have, I want to count parts of my collection. And by default, count should just count my outer collection. We're looking at this one here. Running out of space. If I want to count the inner collections, I would generally have to map my way, traverse my way through this structure. But declaratively, I just want to take the concept of count and apply it along arbitrary dimensions of my data. I know it's homogeneous now. I've taken the time to shape it into this little block structure. Now, let me not have to actually traverse it collection by collection, but just apply count at an arbitrary rank. So here, I get the count of the three rows that are part of this data structure. If I wanted to get the count of each row, that's just a higher order concept on top of count in this world, in a world where arrays are everywhere, where tables are everywhere. Uh, it seems like, okay, big deal, that's just one layer. But the point of an array programming environment is to support arbitrary layers of this, arbitrary dimensionalities. So if you had a report that was three by four by two, and you wanted to be able to do your counting along that, by default, again, three by four by two should give me three as the outer count, but then the count of, and then the next count will be uh, fours, and then a count of each of the, of the inner ones. So this is akin to higher order functions, but it's specific to 
dimensionality of data, and functions that are part of a core array programming environment, having the smarts to be, a, to be applicable in a mathematically appropriate fashion. We saw earlier we had the AND table and the OR table as, as represented with zeros and ones. And that may seem like a cute trick, but when we keep information like a Boolean decision as a zero and a one, we keep a much more transparent representation with all the language of mathematics, even a simple arithmetic at our disposal. And I will, I will defer people to uh, the, the J programming languages documentation to take a look through just the reference section that describes all the, the operations that we kind of, I normally associate as being somewhat higher level and just semantic um, with simple arithmetic functions. And when we keep things as, as numbers, and in this case homogeneous tables of numbers, then we uh, leave ourselves a, a, um, the possibility open to using those, those tools. Um, this is where plus misbehaves. So in an array programming environment, if I add together these collections, that I should be able to, I should be able to get them. The natural thing to do is to add them item-wise. Not as big of a deal for small collections, a much bigger deal for larger collections. All right, I'm close on time, so I will skip ahead. The last piece that I'll show is, is here, the concept of, of copy. So if I have things stored as arrays and I want to uh, process that array, my, my default way of thinking about dealing with characters in a string would be to use filter and go through that. Um, but here I have some arrays that I've, that I've gone through and I say, you know what, actually I just want to use true-false to an extent. I want to use zero and one presence and absence as a tool here, a mathematical tool for, for getting rid of parts of my, of my string data. Mm -mm. Mm -hmm. Oh, we're lazy seeked, sorry. <laughs> anyway, all right, that, I think I've run out of time. I will, I will end with the, a library that has this name will be published sometime in the next week or so. There's a lot of little presentation bits that I, I threw in there. It's not meant to be authoritative or performant. It's, it's a thought experiment about if we have the power of closure, we have the power of Lisp, what could we do if we also had a, a, a library that afforded a natural way to use array programming algorithms on homogeneous views of data? Because at the end of the day, that's our job, period. We live in a heterogeneous world, and we're constantly trying to pare down and find meaningful contexts to do our work in. Thank you.